Welcome to day 127 of Shaped by the Word. Paul Kemp here with Katie Kresge and Matthew Kresge. And uh, we are continuing through uh, 1 Corinthians. Matter of fact, we'll finish 1 Corinthians this week and start in 2 Corinthians. So the book of 1 Corinthians has been a, a letter that Paul is writing to a church that's experiencing significant difficulty. They're divided by their favorite teachers. Uh, and they're not sure how to handle themselves as far as sexual purity goes. Uh, their worship services have been a little bit divisive. They're still uh, not clear about how to uh, you know, treat each other according to dietary laws. And there's one final issue that needs to be dealt with, and this is probably the biggest issue of all the issues, and it may be even an issue that is the heart of the rest of the issues, is their belief in the resurrection. Some believe that the resurrection actually has has not happened. And Paul gives seven reasons or seven uh, different malefacts or different bad effects to this belief, which enters our faith, you know, absolutely useless, you know, in the very end. So we come to one of the most important sections in all of Scripture as Paul speaks about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is the heart of the gospel. So before we uh, read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, let's uh, turn our hearts to the Lord in prayer, offer ourselves to Him, and offer this moment to Him. Matt, do you mind leading yeah. us? Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word. Thank You for um, our time together in it. We thank You that You are a God who has chosen to reveal Yourself um, to us through it. And, and every time we open it, um, God, You do a great work in us. And, and so we pray towards that end. Um, we do offer this moment to You, offer ourselves to You. Uh, Father, that we would glorify you, uh, enjoy you, honor you, lift you up. Um, and Father, as we do so, would you continue to shape us into the image of Christ. Thank you for this time together. Uh, impress these truths on our hearts, and, and may it transform us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I love that prayer. Your God has invited us to enjoy him. Uh, and of course, you uh, always are drawn you know, to Piper's reflections on the Westminster. Yeah in a, a catechism that God is most glorified in us when we are most deeply satisfied in Him and there is nothing more satisfying than what He has done for us through Christ Jesus through the Gospels. Mm. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 Now brothers and sisters I want to remind you of the Gospel I preached to you which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this Gospel you were saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you otherwise you believed in vain. For what I received I pass on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day according to Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas, and then to the Twelve. After that He appeared to more than five hundred of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then He appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all He appeared to me also as one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you have believed. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ, the first fruits. Then when he comes, those who belong to him, then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death, for he has put everything under his feet. Now when it says that everything has been put under him, it is clear that this does not include God himself who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him so that God may be 
all in all. And what a wonderful rehearsal of the gospel. Uh, we have been united with Christ in his, in his death and in his resurrection. Uh, through, his, uh, through his death, our sins are atoned for. Through his resurrection, we are, we're given new, indestructible life that will finally be realized in the final resurrection. So the resurrection is not incidental to the Christian experience. It is the very hope of the Christian experience. And Paul uh, does a wonderful job of painting you know, that picture and setting our hearts on the hope that you know, is set, set before us. So as you guys read these passages, what are some of the things that uh, you know, stand out? I just love how he opens it, that um, he wants to remind them of the gospel. I'll just read it. The gospel I preached to you, which you received, and on which you've taken your stand. By this gospel, you're saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. I mean, this gospel, they stand on it, they've received it, and they are saved by it. Um, I just think, and you are saved. Is that um, a present tense? You are being saved? I think that's what the translation I was reading earlier this morning was, you're being saved. So it's a continual. It is, uh, yeah. It's Fant- a, <laughs> fantastic, Katie. Yeah. Well, uh, we, remind you one, we remind you once again that Katie did take a Greek class. <laughs> I do remember that. <laughs> yes, I Becca, that part. you need to always re- remember that. But that, that's absolutely the gospel by which you are being continually saved or continually brought into the fullness of your salvation. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, know, you are, you know, our salvation is a past event, an ongoing reality, and a future reality yeah. as well. And uh, the way that he phrases it, lovely talks about. It. And, and I also, you know, love what you've already pointed out. It's not, you know, just the entry into. Right. Uh, you know, a relationship with God is the sustaining heart of our relationship with God. And it is the very thing on which we, we take our stand. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we've been talking about you know, in Hebrews, which we're covering on you know, Sunday morning, the definition of a Christian or those who have received the gospel, bear it fruit and uh, maintain, you know, maintain the gospel to the very end. And of course, here we have Paul, you know, with a statement that is very similar to the one that we find in Hebrews by this gospel, you're saved if. You hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you've believed in vain. If it's just a momentary thing that's a passing fad, then you haven't truly believed in the gospel. But if the gospel is bearing fruit and you persevere to the end, then you know that you have received the full effects yeah. of the gospel. You get a little bit of what he means by belief, too. When he, he says, you know, if you, otherwise you have believed in vain, it's not just mere intellectual assent. You know, it's got to be something that completely you know shapes or transforms all of life this believing in the gospel you know is not just a, i've assented to this but it's we've taken our, a stand on it our entire life hangs on the balance you know of, of this truthfulness in the gospel and i love um you know paul says this is the message i've preached to you that christ died for our sins according to scripture he's buried and he was raised and then he goes on and says and he appeared to 500 people most of whom are still alive in other words if you have any doubt to the validity or historical you know event uh, of the resurrection the death and resurrection go talk to some of these people and and, le- and hear from them if you, it's not enough to hear it from me you know hear from these people as well and so, and so you have a little bit of a, a apologetic from paul right you know first corinthians written you know Less than twenty years after, you know, after yeah. the resurrection, so many, you know, are still alive who witnessed the resurrection. Of course, when he talks about the five hundred, that is something that we don't find in the Gospels or in the Book of Acts. Mm-hmm. And so we're deeply curious. Paul tell us, you know, more. This is you know, what I call just kind of a drive-by. <laughs> you know, thing he does. He says, by the way, there's five hundred people who saw him at one time. We know if you know twelve people seeing him at one time in a room, you know, bigger that experienced you know the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. But uh, this is a, you know, and, and he's saying, just talk to those who've actually seen him. Yeah. If you can't take Cephas's word for it, if you can't take my word for it, if you can't take James's, you know, word for it, uh, there are 500 brothers and sisters that he has all appeared to, you know, who are witnesses, you know, to the resurrection. I love that the past speaks to it and the present and, you know, from his perspective, like, look at the scriptures, because according to the scriptures, he is the Messiah, um, and talk to the people that saw him that knew him because they can speak to it as well i mean they're all yeah. witnesses to the fact that he is the fulfillment of the scriptures and that he raised according to the scriptures so. yeah and, and these are two facts of the scripture that were largely missed mm-hmm. one that the messiah must 
suffer mm-hmm. and die for the sins of the people. You know, so so clear reading backwards into Isaiah, right. you know, 53, we all like sheep had gone astray. Each of us had turned to his own way, and the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. And, of course, it speaks of him being bruised and broken and beaten for our transgressions. And, you know, the wounds, you know, for our healing, you know, were, were, were laid on him. Uh, and people largely miss that, and they also largely miss the significance, you know, of the resurrection. Mm. They're expecting, you know, one time, if they expect it at all, a one-time event at the end of history, not an event in the middle of the history, you know, that defines everything that we are. Mm. It is, uh, we've died with him, Paul will say, we've been raised with him. Yeah. Uh, and this is the symbol of, you know, the old passing away and the new coming uh, the new creation, the new, new humanity in Christ. So it's the very heart of the gospel. Yeah. Yeah, you have to love how he links, you know, Christ's death and Christ's resurrection to, according to the scriptures. You know, mm-hmm. he says it both times after he says, you know, Christ died and mm-hmm. Christ was raised. You know, according to the scriptures. Yeah. In other words, this is something we should have seen all along. This is our hope. Yep. You know, we we just missed it. And there's a little event in between. He he, he was buried. Yeah. Uh, Roman soldiers handled his body. You know, the women handled his body. I mean, Nic- I mean Nicodemus. You know, handled his body. Uh, you know, Joseph Arimathea handled his body. All of them are handling, you know, this body and put it in the tomb and roll, you know, back, you know, the stone and the seal is 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 around it. So part of the witness as well, the historical witnesses is, you know, he he, he was he was buried. Many people witnessed his death and the significance of his death. I think this is just such an important question that every believer should ask: is why. Does the resurrection matter? Why is it so important to us? And I mean, this is a huge answer to that question, and I'm really grateful for it. I mean, verse 19: If, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we're uh, of all people must be. I read. I totally butchered that. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we if are you were reading, of all re, if people. If you were reading Greek, it would have been a lot more <laughs> yeah, smooth. So but sometimes in English, we are of all people most to be pitied. I mean, we are like we. What do we have if well, you we know, don't I've, have I've, resurrection? I've always argued with Paul on that point uh, because I think you know this life is deeply enriched by who Christ is, and, oh, yeah. and and we have deep gifts from that. But but you'll remember Paul, and especially as we get into Second Corinthians next week, we'll talk about how we join with Christ in His suffering, and uh, it is the future resurrection that brings meaning to our brokenness and our suffering mm-hmm. and the persecution yeah. that we'll have. And he said, why would anyone undergo? We we do have it a little bit easier than Paul had it, as in a whole lot easier than Paul had it. But mm-hmm. the resurrection is our future hope. And, our, and and we've kind of reversed that over the, you know, over the last few years in our theology. It's more of a prosperity thought, you know, theology, your best life now, as opposed to living for the life to his come, which far surpasses yeah. any any degree of earthly blessing you know, that we would receive now and the presence of God with us even in our poverty exceeds any degree of material blessing you know we receive in Christ as well I do love the little phrase you know as, as we're you know running you know running out of time you know, verse 10 by the grace of God I am what I am in other words a persecutor vile blasphemer you know one who Deserved, you know, the very death sentence of God, and yet was given, you know, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and His grace to me was not without effect. And, and what is the effect? The effects are, you know, His His works. You know, I worked harder than all of them, but His works in and of themselves. Notice this very next phrase: are not His own works, but the working of God in him, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Mm-hmm. What a beautiful picture of the Christian life, yeah. our works that are produced by faith, by grace, through faith, as well as you know the entry into the kingdom, the continuing in the kingdom mm-hmm. as well. Mm-hmm. We didn't even get to talk about as, as an Adam all die. Yeah. So Christ, right? Well, we'll Christ. go quickly. Go quickly. I mean, we, I figured y'all would like be really excited to talk about. We, the we are really, of that. we are really excited about <laughs> we that. Have 30 yeah. and, and you've wasted so much time introducing the topic that we won't get to talk yeah. about it. Go ahead, Matt. Grab it and go. I just, 
Yeah, it's hard not to, right? For it, as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive, but each in turn Christ first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. I mean, that that is our hope, that, you know, as sin enters the world through Adam, so new life, resurrection life, resurrected body, you know, all that will come through yeah. the person and work of Christ. And he is the first fruits because he's been resurrected. You know, he is the guarantee that yeah. one day we shall be resurrected it with is, him. Is earthly people, uh, after the image of Adam, we live in death, we deserve death, and and we experience, you know, we yeah. experience death. As people who have been transformed in the image of Christ as his new creation, we experience life, we live in the fullness of that life, and one day we'll live in an uninterrupted life of fellowship and joy in, in his presence. So uh, our humanity brings death, uh, the transforming power of the Holy Spirit working through the life, death, and resurrection of Christ brings life everlasting. And, and by life, we're not just talking about beating hearts and lungs that are filled. We're talking about the depth of the joy that we're experiencing. Um, and is, it is deeply rich. Fun passage, more more here than we can cover, but uh, wait till Easter. We'll probably use this text <laughs> on Easter Sunday morning. Sounds good. And uh, as we have almost um, every other Easter for the last uh, 20 years for me. <laughs> Katie, could you, uh, could you close us sure. off? Time to prayer. Father, wow. I mean, to think of how important the resurrection is to us now today, um, it's overwhelming to think of what it would be like um, if we didn't have this hope, if we didn't have um, the, real, the resurrection of Christ um, and our future resurrection um, to, to look forward to. Father, thank you for all the ways that that um, affects us now and all the ways that it will continue to affect us um, in the future as your people. Would you, would your spirit just um, continue to show us more and more the importance of the resurrection? And um, would we place our hope in you, God? Thank you for your word. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.